The second thing that you can do is to create a positive dying environment. It sounds almost like an oxymoron, but it isn't. It's important to, to set up a positive environment for the person who's dying. Many people don't understand that, that dying is not a static event. It's a very dynamic process. I mean, if, if you ever seen any of these contraptions in uh, an exercise place or on TV where it's like a, a, a platform and you're, you're on there trying to balance, and the idea is to try to take, maintain that balance no matter what's happening. And so the people on there are adjusting, and, and they finally got it. They may be in an awkward position, but it, they're perfectly balanced. Now imagine someone coming behind them and just giving them a little push. And immediately they're off kilter again, and they're going to try to establish that balance, and they eventually do, and someone pushes on the other side. That's what dying is like. The person who is dying is continually trying to find balance in their life. And they're trying to do that to deal with both the, the, the physical aspects of death and also the psychological ones. So if that's what they're doing, if, and sometimes it occurs not only daily but hourly, things are constantly changing. And in order for the person to deal with their death, they have to maintain that balance. And there are a number of things that you can do to make it easier to attain that balance. The first thing is to remove all unnecessary medical equipment and supplies. Can you imagine you are now immobile, you're in bed, your world is, is whatever you can see. And what is usually in that area? Oxygen tanks, maybe a defibrillator, um, wipes, absorbent briefs, medicines, you know, all those things are there. Everything to remind you that your body is failing. Okay? That's not very positive. What I usually ask people to do when I go into a home or even into um, a nursing facility is, what is it, whatever is an absolutely critical, move away. It may be less convenient. You may have to walk outside to get the medicines. But that's not what someone should be looking at as they're dying. So that's the very, very easy thing. Just move things away. Move them to the side. The second easy thing is, is flowers. Again, you know, what, what would you like to look at before you're dying? Well, flowers are terrific. Only problem with flowers, though, is sometimes there is a medical condition which warrants not having that in the room. So you just check with the doctor. But that's always good to have. Pictures. Pictures are terrific. I had a, uh, a, a client, a patient, um, who was dying, he had um, his larynx removed. So he couldn't speak, he just wrote. And the first day that I met him, um, one of the very first things that he wanted to talk about was his death, which is very unusual. Most of the time, you know, people will wait, usually at least one or two sessions, sometimes never. But he wanted to talk about it right away. And I asked him something that I've never asked anybody before, and I don't even know why it came out. But I asked him, I said, is if you could do one thing before you died, and I could help you do it, what would that be? And it didn't even take him you know, a few seconds to immediately write out fishing. And he had been an avid fisherman all of his life. So I said, OK, let's see what I could do. So the next day, this was in San Francisco, the next day um, I took him, you know, I had permission to take him out of the hospice, and we went in my, my SUV, because uh, he couldn't walk anymore, he was in a wheelchair, and he always had to have oxygen with him. So we went to Lake Merced, I don't know if you've ever been to Lake Merced. They probably haven't had fish in Lake Merced in 15 years, but that's where he had fished before, and that's where you know, he wanted to go back there. So we, we were a, a sight because, again, it, there's a ramp that goes down to the water. And I cast the line for him, and he started fishing. And at which point, I just started taking pictures. I took pictures of him fishing, of the lake, of the birds, of, of everything. Uh, he only lasted for about an hour before he got too tired. And we, we went back to the hospice. And I was going to bring, next day I was going to bring in pictures for him. And when I got in there, he was already unresponsive. 
Now, being unresponsive doesn't necessarily mean that you're about to die. It means sometimes the body just shuts down temporarily. And he was unresponsive when, when I came to the hospice, but I had all these pictures. So I took the pictures and I just covered the entire wall with pictures of him fishing. And I put it on his, uh, it's like a, like a tray that goes in front of the bed. So everything was covered with these pictures. Um, and then I left. So he actually woke up the next day. And so he opened his eyes. And according to there's the first thing he saw were these incredible pictures of him fishing at Lake Merced. Um, and it was enough to give him a lot of peace and comfort until he did die. But, you know, pictures are wonderful. Pictures of family, pictures of favorite things. You can also bring in mementos. Uh, I just spoke to a woman about a week ago at another presentation. And she was telling me about her husband who had a certain form of dementia. And their life together had been one in which they always talked to one another. It was a wonderful relationship. And as he got farther on into the disease, he spoke less, to the point where he wasn't speaking to her at all. And for her, it was very difficult, because she didn't know how to connect with him anymore. And I said, you know, was there anything he was really passionate about before he got sick? And she, her eyes went up, she said, oh, yeah, golf. You know, he played golf all the time. And I said, does he have any trophies? He said, yes, he's got a, a cabinet full. I said, okay, bring in the trophies. And line them up in front of his field of vision. And so she did that. And, you know, he saw them, and it was, you know, something clicked. And they were able to have, not necessarily conversation, he never talked again to her. But it was something that, that connected the two of them. So you can do something even simple like that, is just have things in the room that the person can connect with and that are positive in their lives. Um, music is another very easy thing to use. There's a couple caveats with music. One, it shouldn't be long. You know, don't just turn on the, the music and let it go forever, because that, that just is, it doesn't work well. 10, 15 minutes. It should be soft. There should be. Uh, easy or you know easy transitions between notes. Now I, it sounds like I'm describing new wave music, but not necessarily. But it's something that is going to take that person to a special place. So that you can do. You can also reduce the noise that's, that's occurring. Again, remember I said before, dying is hard work, and um, oftentimes I will go into, especially nursing homes, and I'll see the television blasting away the person. And, you know, it's done for two reasons, I think. I think the first is people think that the person who's dying wants to be distracted. People who are dying do not want to be distracted. They're trying to deal with the end of their lives. And something like a TV is terrible. But I think another reason that, um, that TVs are used is that it it allows the staff some distance from the person who's dying. I mean, even staff in, in facilities are uncomfortable with death. They may see it, you know, every day, but they're uncomfortable with it. So, you know, turn off that TV. It's just, it's just not appropriate. Um, don't argue in front of the person who's dying. I mean, this is their death. When people argue, you know, families argue with one another, I, and I've seen it occasionally. Um, it's something that is really disruptive to the person who's dying. If you need to argue, argue outside, away from them. The other thing, which is really hard for people to think about, is don't grieve you know, excessively in front of the person who's dying. The reason, I mean, I'm not saying that, that you should not legitimately feel the potential loss, because obviously you will. But what happens is, the person who is dying witnesses a loved one who is incredibly despondent about his or her death. And what they may do is try to hold on to life longer than is really appropriate. So the time, your time with the person who's dying should be one that deals with things that are positive. I mean, celebrate their life. Don't mourn it. Mourn it later. Mourn it after their death. Mourned in another room, but not in front of them. Mm -hmm.